This week's podcast is sponsored by the Bowers & Wilkins 600 Series 3. The eighth generation of one of Hi-Fi's most acclaimed ranges features some of the most comprehensive upgrades the 600 Series has ever received. The Bowers & Wilkins 600 Series 3 is designed for every music lover. It's the attainable way to experience the joys of true sound at home. Discover more at BowersWilkins.com. Hello and welcome to the AV Forums podcast for Monday the 27th of November in the year 2023. It's almost done this year, I can't believe how fast it's going. Um, tonight we have regulars and we have a new face, so let me introduce the regulars. We've got Martin, Jules, Ed and Ian. Good evening guys. Hi Phil. And our new face, uh, new reviewer. Matt's been around a while, but this is his first podcast, so welcome along to the podcast, Matt. Um, just quickly... For those who maybe haven't seen your reviews yet, don't know who you are and what you do, uh, give us a quick, brief introduction to yourself. Uh, American by nature, moved over to Britain about 10 years ago. Um, love AV stuff in the sides, I guess in the other world. I'm an IT guy, work on architecture, um, but absolutely love uh, audio and video. Excellent. And the reviews that you've done for us so far are? I did the Bowers and Wilkins 600 series some cinema package, and then I did a monitor audio gold and their new Anthra sub package as well. Okay, excellent. So we're going to cover those tonight. Um, the reviews are also up on the website, so go and have a look at those if you want to get into them in uh, in detail. So what else do we have coming up uh, tonight? Um, well, uh, we have quite a bit to get through. So I'm looking at the Philips OLED Plus 908 uh, OLED TV. This is their flagship. It uses an MLA panel, Meta technology on board. Um, very similar to the Panasonic MZ2000 and, of course, the LG G3. So we'll be going into that in a little bit. Uh, again, the review is live. There's a video review on YouTube as well. Um, so I'm not going to get into it in, in great detail, but we will cover it very briefly uh, tonight and point out a few uh, bits and pieces about that. I'll also be previewing our Editor's Choice Awards. So the first of those went live today, the Hi-Fi Awards. Thank you very much for your hard work there, Ed. Um we're not going to get into that tonight, uh, but I will preview it. We'll tell you what's coming up in the next two weeks in terms of the awards, what to look out for uh, when stuff uh, is going to appear. Uh, Matt's going to be looking at the Bowers & Wilkins 600S3 package and, of course, the Audio Gold, uh, Audio Gold uh, 5G Home Cinema package. Uh, Martin's going to be looking and previewing uh, his upcoming reviews. And, of course, Ed's going to do the whole hi-fi section. And you're also looking at a, an interesting product that's created a, quite a bit of conversation on the forums. Yet again, you've got a habit of doing this, Ed. So mm. we're, uh, we're going to cover that in the hi-fi section. And, of course, we've got your feedback to get through now. Um, you know, when you ask questions, whether it's on YouTube in the uh, underneath the description in the, the comment section, or if it's on AV forums, in the podcast forum underneath this podcast. We do read your comments. Uh, we do take them in and uh, Andy collates those during the weeks and uh, puts the most interesting ones forward where we can answer those questions for you. And of course, a lot of you um, actually don't watch live. You watch uh, uh, a little bit further in, in the week when you're walking the dog or commuting to work and so on. And we appreciate you want to ask questions as well. So there's a couple of ways you can do that. Like I say, in the comments or, uh, you know, head over to AV Forums and put it in the thread. Or you can send an email to podcast at avforums.com. Uh, whichever way you choose, uh, we will uh, answer them if we can. Uh, so we've got quite a bit of feedback to get through. This is going to be quite TV heavy. Um, so apologies uh, to start there. But there is a, a break where we get into some hi-fi comments. And then there's some general comments about the podcast, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit of detail. Uh, but first of all, I've got a couple of Panasonic things to get through. So uh, the MZ1500, just to bring you up to speed what that TV is again. So that's the, the one just under the 2000, the 2000 being the flagship. Uh, the 2000 has a sound bar, amplifying speakers, uh, side speakers as well. Um, and it has the MLA panel in it. The 1500 doesn't have the MLA. Uh, panel and it doesn't have the Atmos sound system. In the past, it always had the, the top line panel just without the sound system. Uh, Panasonic have changed that this year for the MZ1500. So, your comments uh, were Port West 400 said personally he really likes in the inbuilt sound bar and he hopes it sounds good. So, there you go. Um, Panasonic have done a bit of research there and there are customers out there like Port West 400 that. Uh, probably looking for that. Uh, Mark Banner 6473 uh, said, let's be honest, most people who can afford a higher end Panasonic OLED uh, at those prices will probably have a 5.1 or more sound system already. Um, and that has been uh, the general argument, certainly with our audience out there. Uh, you guys already have your sound systems you're looking for. 
uh, basically a monitor with the best possible panel on there. So yeah, we get that mark um, and, and agree with that point of view. Um, the other comments in here, nothing is true, uh, says Phil, um, not really related to the video. Uh, this is uh, obviously from YouTube. Uh, but if it came down to the LZ1500 or an S90C or S94C, I'm assuming you mean the S95C there, both 65 inches, which ones would you go for and why? That's that's a difficult question, but because the 1500 has last year's flagship panel, not this year's, whereas the 95C uh, has this year's QD OLED panel in it, I would go with the 95C um, if that was my choice, uh, basically because I'd be getting the better picture um, from there. But I would be losing out on Dolby Vision, wouldn't get Dolby Vision, but I think uh, I would be swayed by that. Um, and then uh, Isaac 6626. Um, Phil, what do you think about Panasonic's upscaling and ability to deliver streamed content in a clean manner in comparison to the A80L from Sony? Sony's got the better processing. Um, simple as it has uh, it, it has all the filters in there that make sure um, that compression looks good. Um, there is a, a decontouring filter in there. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks nice. Smooth gradation uh, control. Um, so if you have got lower bit rate uh, content, it does tend to handle it a little bit better than Panasonic. Unfortunately, Panasonic, like the Philips that we're going to come on to this evening, has a little bit of posterization in there. Um, no matter what processing is being applied, there's posterization um, and some uh, noisy blacks as well. Um, and again, don't take this the wrong way. We're talking about tiny little details, but it's the tiny little details, obviously, that you guys want to know about. Those are the tiny little differences there. Um, so yeah, the Sony does have the cleaner looking uh, processing, if you're asking the question between the two. Uh, MX950 from Panasonic. So that was the mini LED. It's the first mini LED from Panasonic, just to bring everybody else up to speed here. Um, so we've got a couple of questions, uh, mainly from YouTube. Um, so SJ460162, uh, obviously that's your phone number attached to your initials there. Uh, nice review. How does it compare to the QN95C? Uh, QN95C has a better local dimming algorithm. Samsung will be doing it uh, a little bit uh, of time now uh, compared to Panasonic uh, with the L LCD side of things. Um, again, we're talking about tiny little differences. Um, the other thing is that the QN95C does have blooming suppression. It is a little bit more aggressive. Um, so you do lose a little bit in terms of your peak highlight details and a little bit of dynamic range. But the Panasonic has blooming suppression on there as well. Uh, QN95C goes a little bit uh, brighter. So hopefully that answers your question there. Uh, Deep Blue Sky K uh, chips in with approximately 120 dimming zones for a 55-inch version. Seems a little bit disappointing. What you've got to remember is this is mini LED, so it might be 120 zones, but it's, it also has thousands of LEDs per zone. Um, not 100% sure exactly how many on the Panasonic, uh, but it has 120 separate dimming zones. You could have 50 dimming zones. If you've got a really good algorithm, um, local dimming algorithm, and it doesn't matter how many zones you've got, it'll look pretty good. Um, maybe Jules can back me up on this one. Jules, you've seen lots of these uh, TVs. It all comes to, you know, you could have 2,000 zones, but if your process is rubbish, the image is rubbish, basically. Yeah. I think you just said that, Phil. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, if you haven't got the good, good algorithm backing it up, then it's a bit of a waste, isn't it? So it's not always the case that the number of dimming zones, the higher it is, always gives you the better picture. It it just depends. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Um, and another question um, from the, the this same person here is the MX950 doesn't seem to fare much better than TCL's C845. Um yeah, I mean, there are differences there. Obviously, you're getting Panasonic's uh, image processor on there, the HCX processor, which is very good. The upscaling is good. Um, TCL is decent, uh, very decent for the money. It's obviously a lot cheaper than the Panasonic. So it's going to come down to basically if you have a brand bias there, if you want to go for Panasonic, you're going to go for Panasonic. Um, are you getting any better? Mm, probably not. Uh, TCL, up and coming brand, they're doing some really exciting uh, bits and pieces. Um, and I'm actually tomorrow uh, going to visit them in Poland to have a look at some of the oh. big stuff coming next year. So um, they are doing a lot of good things at the moment. They want to do some even better things and they want to compete in the market and so on. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what comes of that. So, yeah, it, it's going to come down to choose your poison on that one. Very, very similar TVs. There is a bit of a price gap. And it's a bit it's the same like the, the higher end TVs, you know, the Sony A95L is considerably more expensive than 
the competition out there, the LG G3 and so on. Um, but a lot of people are going to go and buy the Sony, even though the picture quality differences are not huge. It's going to come down to what you want at the end of the day. So uh, values very much uh, with you on that one. Um, and then I think there's just one one more, which was the problem with Panasonic is app support or the lack of it. They do use their own uh, smart system. I've got to say, I like it. It's really simple. Um, it doesn't try to do anything over the top and it works. Now, does it have a, a huge amount of apps? No. Does it have free view play and all the catch up stuff? Yeah. Is the picture quality good? Yeah. Picture quality is good on it. So again, it's going to come down to uh, what you want. But Jules, at the end of the day, um, people can just plug in a box if they want that has everything on it and not rely on the smart TV system. And you can pick these things up for 20, 30 yeah, quid now it is. Yeah, they're not they're not expensive, are they? And um, if you you can get an Apple TV box, they do they do great stuff on them. So you're not limited. You're paying, you're, you're paying a bit more for the Apple TV box. You are. We'll point that a couple of hundred quid then. But yeah, you are. But um, yeah, it, it's good quality. Um, yeah, is, is what you're saying. So if you want good quality with your streaming and so on, there are other ways of doing that. So uh, that wraps up the TV feedback and questions. Ed, over to you with the hi-fi stuff. Yes. Um... I'm. I sense that there's going to something for here is going to haunt me for the rest of my days. Um, first of all, uh, T Force, uh, is there any chance we could have features plural on the DIY Hi-Fi space? It seems there's an increasing number of DIY streamers, DAX, and even amps and speakers, but I've no idea how they compare to products from existing manufacturers. Would really like to hear my views on this uh, area. Now, this is true as far as it goes. If you are remotely handy at building certain things, um, there are a number of kits. And there is a number of sort of easily modifiable items that you can achieve quite remarkable things for at, um, at commensurately sensible prices because you're cutting out the fairly labor intensive purposes of building it. It's a difficult thing to write about for two reasons. The first, and I'll stick my hand up on this, I am a ham handed oaf. So I do not build things particularly often. Um, so that means that I'm going to have to put the, put the sort of the bat signal out for someone. If someone wants to stick their hands up, and talk about this um, and you feel you can write about it or you are in a position where we can discuss it and I might be able to get your words down in a way that you, you're happy with. Yes, we can look at this. I will say that this is not me opening the doors to necessarily reviewing this stuff. This is the same reason that car, manuf uh, car magazines and websites are always a bit sketchy about reviewing kit cars because the performance of the kit car is wholly dependent on the quality of the bloke in the garage that built it. Um, so essentially benchmarking it against something where I know you will get the same results every time is not an immediately straightforward thing to do, but discussing what is possible and what is out there would be interesting. And I am open to doing it. Um, then, um, Bobis who has commented on a number of items. If you're going to have Ed's standalone pod on YouTube, can it be called Selly vision? And, I have a horrible yes. suspicion that regardless <laughs> of what happens now, however much I complain, I don't yeah. have any, um, I don't have any uh, means of stopping this. Do I, I it's completely. I don't think so. Really. No, 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 I think um, so. And, and that no. brings us on to um, why that question was asked. So if you didn't listen to the last couple of uh, podcasts, um, we are changing things up for uh, next year, 2024. We want to, um, uh, make the podcasts more appealing, more useful for you, more educational, um, open up our experience between all of us um, and have you ask the questions and we'll present uh, those back to you and, and be a bit more focused. And that means that we're going to stop doing the live broadcasts, um, but you will have a pod at least one podcast every week of the year. Um, we're going to pre-record them. Uh, we are uh, basically at the start of the year going to put some kind of uh, easy way of thinking this thread through each one so we will talk about things um in depth and in detail um so we've got some of the comments coming through let me uh, touch on some of the comments and then i can maybe uh, uh expand on some of those so you know where we're going with this so uh, uh matt says comments general podcast comment he says one of your <clears throat> as one of your american this is not you matt is it <clears throat> no 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 
<laughs> just making sure. There's more than just one American. Yeah, there's just, there's, yeah, there's more than one of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as one of your American viewers who has been on board since the uh, audio version, I can honestly say I love the podcast, just the way uh, they are presented. The best thing about both podcasts is the interaction amongst all the members, which I find loads of fun to watch and so on. Um, yeah, uh, there is that aspect. We want to hang on to that aspect. Um, so we will, um, it won't just be one person presenting podcasts. We're going to break them up so there will be TV, there'll be hi-fi, there'll be home cinema, home audio, um, and then the movies guys are going to split their podcast up into different sections. But the there will be the same faces on um, some of these podcasts, so it's not just going to be one person talking, uh, but it will mean that we can deep dive a little bit more into subjects. So, And again, I don't feel guilty on a TV podcast talking about TVs when I know the other guys out there have got interesting things to say about home AV and so on. That's kind of the idea of the way it's going to go. And Toon Army said, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that he likes to propose changes and the deep dives into specific elements of the AV world and invite guests and experts. Yeah, that's another thing. If they are pre-recorded, it's much easier to get guests on. Um, a lot of us work during the day, work from home, um, so we can record the podcast at times to suit guests and that kind of thing, which makes it easier to bring people in and get them involved. So, yeah, definitely going to get the industry involved. Um, Jules works in a very interesting industry in terms of professional calibration and studios and so on. We'll try and get colorists and graders in so they can answer your questions on, you know, just how far away are these grading monitors to your NTV and and does everything have to look like a Sony grading monitor? Well, no, Sony's not the only name out there. Um, you would think it was the only looking at a lot of coverage out there. So, again, we'll get into this and and we can deep dive into these subjects. So, thanks for your uh, comments there, Toon Army. Invisible Kid asks, um, with interviews and deep dives, uh, there's plenty of topics for each podcast. The only additional thought is how do you post them via the podcast? Uh, is it going to get too much for people to find what they're looking for? Hopefully not. And, and that's I'm um, you know I'm not reading his comments out uh, word for word there. I'm summarizing what he's just said, but summarizing what he's just said, but. Um, basically you'll be able to find what you're looking for and there will be some podcasts you, you're not interested in and it's perfectly fine to skip over them hopefully you're interested in all of them if you're interested in this subject but because we're splitting them out into separate sections if you really want to deep dive into tv you can if you want to really deep dive into home av and sound bars and that kind of thing or you know full on 5.1 7.1 atmos systems and all that kind of thing we're going to cover it all It'll, it will have a section within uh, each of these podcasts so yeah, yeah thank you very much um for your comments on this and there's just one left which is wreck it wreck it yeah uh guys um really happy with proposed changes the one thing i really wanted was the consistency of a weekly podcast you're going to get that and you also said an hour long how's 45 minutes for you um that's what we're going to aim for 30 30 minutes 45 minutes that's the average commute um and i think we can get if we're going to deep dive and be one subject at a time i think that's the way to do it. So if you do have feedback, uh, you got any ideas of what you want us to cover for this coming year um, in the separate uh, podcasts and so on, just give us your thoughts. You can do that uh, in the forum underneath this podcast and you can do it on this video on YouTube uh, just in the comment section. Let us know. And of course, um, if you come up with some really good ideas, we will implement them. Uh, absolutely. One of these days we might actually do a decent podcast, but no promises. No promises on that one. Uh, right. Um, Ed. Uh, what is that under your uh, on your top <laughs> left? There? Is it something crawled up and died there, or yeah, is this like November? I've, actually, this is, congratulations! This, it looks great. No, this is this is the the final phase of November now. Um, uh, I haven't enjoyed this. Um, that we went through the selling alcohol to miners phase, uh, the um, <laughs> Ned Flanders phase, and we're now firmly into somewhere between man interviewed on bbc news in 1977 and um i don't know just sex offender basically it's not, it's not a good look <laughs> but it is for a good cause um and uh i first of all i'd like to thank phil uh jules and stuart who behind the uh, behind the camera um who have all donated to this um so thank you very much for that no, no. we have beaten the modest target uh, which is uh great news um my partner uh, set out to run 60k in a month uh, she passed 100 at the weekend so um, yeah, excellent you know, she's she's well she, she's more than kept her side of the bargain um i mean we might reverse roles next year she can do the facial hair and i'll i'll try running we'll see how that goes um 
but no thank you very much it's for men's mental health um uh which is uh, for it shouldn't be but it is a touchy subject and this is going to go some way to uh, hopefully assisting uh people out there so yes thank you uh we'll stick the comp the uh, uh age up in the comments thing again if you uh, want to take pity on this ridiculous appearance of mine someone commented before we went live that it looks like i'm wearing one of those joke glass nose mustache ensembles and i, I promise you I'm, I'm not it's physically attached to me it would be very nice if i could put it down but i can't it would be a great reveal at the end <laughs> <laughs> so yes that's where we are uh so thank you so much for that yeah that, you should, that's you should get the full kenneth branner Oh no! I, I think, uh, this is this has been actually it's been a, a balancing act because um, the the dimensions that we've got here are the, the the threshold of acceptability. Any shorter than that, you run unfortunate historical connotations. <laughs> Any longer than that, uh, I don't know how people with handlebar mustaches handle it. It gets into your mouth, and it's utterly horrendous. I don't. I mean, it's just been. I can't even. What's I, it? What's it like for food debris getting trapped? Mm. It's not ideal. You know no. how much I like soup, and this has not been a happy. <laughs> this is no. But it's well, all you can do it twice. <laughs> you look a bit like uh, Griff Reese Jones. I've just. I, there, there yeah. are there are very few good sexy analogies going on. This, so it's <laughs> it's it is what it is. Um, so yes, but no, thank you to the people who have donated. Um, and yeah, well, I, I'm probably going to run it to fractionally after November for long and complicated reasons. But it it, it will be gone for 2024. Well, it's for a good cause, Ed. Well yeah. done. It looks fantastic. Um, Bill's already promised everybody the same faces, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm, I, I, I think that there's a degree of variability in this. Either that, or I will go for a sort of one of those uh, '30s pencil mustaches, and I can you know, keep a very uh, a low, a, a, a low, a sort of a, a, a food-friendly one. So, yes, that's what's going on there. Um, yeah, so thank you. It's um, quite something, isn't it? Yeah, well done, Ed. Uh, right, I, I did it once, and unfortunately, it just it comes through ginger, and <laughs> I, I just found never again, never again. Are you, are you Scottish? Yeah, I am. Have you oh. figured that one out? Oh. <laughs> no, nothing wrong with gingers, by the way, Phil. Thanks. No, 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 no. Nothing wrong with gingers at all. It's just when my hair's black up here and it's just, <laughs> yeah, that's that's just a, a bit bold a bit look. Yeah, miss my, Yeah, just a bit. Uh, but well done, Ed. Right, right. Do you want to do current competitions, Ed? Yes. Um, if you if you're listening to us from outside the UK, I'd I'd go and make a cup of tea or um, <laughs> translate Hardy's works into <laughs> Greek. Um, whatever suits you. Um. Right, you can win a pair of Astlin Kern UW100 Mark II True Wireless earphones, courtesy of AV.com, worth £270. Um, these have got full range balanced armature drivers and support Bluetooth 5.2 with Aptex Adaptive. There's ambient listening modes and a battery life of up to 29 hours in total or nine and a half hours of continuous playback. Um, so that's a lot of earphone. Uh, that's open until January. Uh, Humax A1 4K Ultra HD streaming box and three Humax Wi Fi smart plugs. Um, so you can win an Android TV streaming box, which has got all manner of cleverness on it. Um, and then smart plugs, which uh, can be controlled by your voice, making it easy to switch devices on and off remotely when paired with the Humax Smart Living app, which is a useful thing in this day and age. You've got until Thursday, the 21st of December on that one. Uh, there's also a chance to win the Wharfdale DX3 Home Cinema Pack, a uh, stylish and compact home cinema speaker set uh, based on the company's Diamond 12s. Uh, that's courtesy of Peter Tyson. It's worth £500. You're going to have to get a shift on with that. It is open until midnight on Wednesday. So if you're listening to this, after Wednesday, sorry, that one isn't open. However, um, I'm sent all the people who were listening um, outside the UK away. But you, if you are and you have made it back, you can win a $500 voucher to spend at MPB, the platform for buying, selling, and trading used photo and video gear. They are very, very good. I have used them on a number of occasions. That is open until midnight on third on Tuesday, the 12th of December, I should say. And then, my word, we've got discs coming out of every orifice. Yeah, um, I think open... I think we'll just pick the pick a few main ones. But if you're interested in discs, head over to yeah. The I mean, read the full list. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, there's things I don't even know what these things are. Uh, I mean, the Ginger <laughs> Snaps trilogy. I mean, that's that's open until Wednesday. Um, you can win that on limited edition Blu-ray. Uh, the Wandering Earth two uh, closes on second of December on Blu-ray. 
Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. I saw that. It was quite good. Um, that's um, newly published. Uh, Picard Final Season. I quite enjoyed that. Oppenheimer. Uh, oh, yeah. Bound to be a test disc of uh -huh. some description. Yeah, so, really. yeah, there's. if you head over to avforums.com forward slash competitions, there is bound to be something which blows your frock up. Um, it's on a variety of formats. Um, and so we've got hardware and software covered. Um, but basically, if you're looking at the list of things to get people for Christmas and you're thinking, I can't afford any of that, just enter every single competition going and people can win some prizes that they weren't expecting can't they so yeah, all absolutely. good absolutely thank you very much ed um and we've got some new patrons and some people bought us a coffee as well jules tell us about them yeah we do um we have swiss phony and we have mark james who if it's the mark james i know i've calibrated a few mark hello thank you very much and a couple of coffees bought mr black 79 and john bn1 as well thank you very much as well yeah, thank you, uh, everybody, for your support. It really is appreciated. Patrons, all the new, and, uh, of course, the new Bias a Coffee. Uh, thank you very much for that. We'll give you the details a little bit later on uh, in the podcast on how to do all that. Uh, but, right, let's get on with the show. So let's move on to TVs. Uh, this review is live on the site now. Uh, you can go and read it and see all the test results and everything, or you can watch uh, the video which there's also a video live so you can go and watch that as well so i don't really need to get into it in any great detail here um which is a good job because we're taking 25 minutes to get the podcast started tonight um so i'm going to be quite quick with this because we've got a new reviewer as well who's uh, desperate to tell us all about some of the bits and pieces that he's been looking at uh so the oled plus 908 the philips oled plus 908 Josie's had to play with this as well so we were invited down to abbey road studios last week uh, it was last week, wasn't it? Or was it the week before? I I, I don't know. It all runs into one uh, week before. Yeah. Thank you for that, Martin. Um, but yeah, we, we had a look at it. Jules managed to get his calibration kit onto it. Um, I've had one in for review as well. I've actually had two in for review, a 65 and a 55. The reviews for the 55 inch. So this is a 4K MLA equipped uh, TV. We're meta technology, uh, which means it has the boosty brightness uh, like the LG G3 and the Panasonic MZ2000. Very similar to both of those screens. Uh, picture quality wise, it obviously has the P5 processor from Philips. Uh, Danny, who is down at Abbey Road, and there is videos coming, which you'll you'll be able to see in the next week or two. Uh, those videos from our day there, where we went in ambulate in the TV in a bit more detail. Uh, but basically, Danny's developed the P5 processor. Um, and some of the picture modes on there. So it will do filmmaker mode, which is obviously what a lot of you guys out there are interested in, certainly what myself and Jules uh, like to see it on TVs as well, because it gets uh, as close as it can out of the box uh, to the industry standards for uh, for you to watch TV as it was, or films as it was uh, mastered and intended to be seen. Um, but there are other modes on there. One of the interesting things was that um, Philips has done a number of events with AV Forums members, invited them along to different things. And taking on the feedback uh, that they've been given, one of the bits of feedback was that Danny always liked to show his vivid mode against everybody else's vivid mode because at the end of the day, and he's quite right with his figures, about 80% of people, when they buy a new TV, they never change the settings. They get out of the box, they put it on the stand, and they never touch it. They don't know what a menu is. So um, his thinking behind that was, well, let's make it a nice balanced um, uh, picture profile that is bright and colorful but tries to to stay as accurate as possible and um one of the bits of feedback was well why are you calling it vivid mode because that has negative connotations um to av enthusiasts and even people out there that just are a little bit interested in tech if you say vivid mode to people then oh no that's too bright vivid and you know gross in terms of colors and all the rest of it but um, maybe jules you can chip in at this point because uh, you yeah. obviously had what Danny has to say about it. So what's your thoughts? They, they call it um, crystal clear now, not vivid. And thanks to AV Forum's members, uh, that feedback was taken on board, and that's what they call it now. So what was your thinking behind it? Well, it's not as vivid as the normal kind of vivid modes you see out there. It's a, it's a little bit more restrained. It's a little bit more more refined. It's not something necessary I would use or you would use, Phil, but but um, as you say, if anybody's going to switch their TV on, it's going to be in that mode. It's certainly better than eco mode, which the LGs start off with. Um, so, yeah, I mean, horses for courses there. Um, as I say, if that's something that appeals to you in a non-reference environment, I would always advocate, you know, get your environment as close to you as you can to reference, put it in filmmaker mode, and 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 you, you, you're pretty damn close to a calibrated display. But um, their crystal clear mode, 
it's not as bad as some of the other vivid modes I've seen around. Yeah. I don't want it to sound like um you know, it's Pepsi, is that okay? Damning uh, with faint praise. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's actually very clever what, what it's one of those things. It is it, the so. antithesis of the absolute core value of necessarily what we've been banging on about for years and years and years. But if you are going to have one of these modes, it's the same as the artificial noises that your car can make, uh, you know, pumping noise through the speakers mm. and, you know, artificial crackles and pops, isn't it? If you're going to do it, it's got to be a balance of uh-huh. believability, subtlety, and not just being a cringeworthy thing that you use for 30 seconds. And I'm yeah. all for yeah. consumer choice. If they're doing it in such a way that it's a mode that every now and again you'll switch to, and it actually can look quite fun. Uh-huh. Yeah, why not? I mean, if you know, yeah. if we avoid the sort of everyone looking like David Dickinson sort of effect, then that's all good, isn't it? You know, so... Yeah. And I think that's where Danny's kind of coming from. I mean, again, it's not something that myself and, and Jules would would necessarily choose to to watch anything in. But you've got to think that there's a wider market out there. There's a wider audience out there. Not everybody's that interested in in accuracy. And Jules, not everybody lives in a grading suite. At the end of the day, to to get no. them a, a, a you know an accurate uh, image to to reference standards. So you know there is some. Yeah, you know, used to modes like these, where at least they're trying to do something that that doesn't look garish yeah. and in your face. When you're outside of that reference environment, you are having to interpret the references accordingly. So we're going to increase the the nits on your SDR. So it's not going to be a hundred nits. It's probably going to, if you've got all the lights on, you're not even going to be at 150. You're going to be more than that. Uh, you're going to switch from a 2.4 probably to a 2.2 gamma. Um, so you are making some accommodation for the environment um, in that situation. I mean, I always choose to watch with all the lights off in a reference mode, but but, but if you can't do that, if you don't want to do that, it's, you know, you could do worse. Um, but, you know, it's, let's say, it's uh, horses for courses. Yeah. So if you want to get uh, into my uh, unbiased thoughts uh, following proper testing of the TV and everything else, then the reviews are up there. Uh, you can go and have a look at the charts. You can see um, how it measures and so on. Uh, some of the things that didn't pop up in the charts, posterization is an issue, the same as it is with the Panasonics uh, for the last couple of years. Um, so if you've got bright objects, and again, it's just something you're going to see every now and again uh, for a fleeting moment, it's going to be there and you, and you may or may not see it. Um, but being a reviewer, I have to point these things out when, when they are there. Um, it's not a deal breaker for a lot of people, but just be aware that you know it could be there. Um, and if you go looking for it, you'll find it. Um, do other sets do a better job of it? Yeah, the the LG and the Sony are, are much better. You don't get any of those issues. So, uh, yeah, it's it's going to be what you're looking for. But the reviews are up there. Go and have a look at the reviews and stay tuned for those videos as well because it was an interesting day. We didn't only just talk about uh, picture con- uh, picture quality and so on, but we did sit uh, Jules and I and, yep. and we quizzed Danny and we asked him uh-huh. some of the tough questions, you know, that you guys would want answered. So, and Danny was good enough, gracious enough to to sit there and and actually answer all the questions that was put to him. So those videos are coming up. There's one on Ambulite as well, uh-huh. um, which is a great feature. It, it's something that I think gets lost a lot um, when it comes to discussing TVs and, and people maybe have a, a negative connotation of what Ambulite is because they've seen it flashing behind the TV and so on. But it uses a bias light. Um, this is something that is used in a professional environment that Jules works in on a daily basis. Um, it, it can be used as a bias light. You can calibrate it to the wall well, color in the room and, and you can you have everything there, don't you, Jules? Yeah, and, and, and of course, you know, I think we, we spoke to Dieter about that, didn't we? He was keen to say that actually Ambulite began as a bias light system mm-hmm. and then only developed into all the other funky sort of usages that we see common in people's living rooms. Um, so, you know, they were keen to stress that it can be set up properly as a reference bias light in, in that sort of situation. So, it, yeah. you know, it's, it's it's good to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, that rounds up on on the Philips. Uh, go check out the reviews. And of course, like I say, those videos are coming up soon. There was one other video. Oh yeah, Bowers and Wilkins. Um, we were in Studio Two. If oh. you, you're aware, Abbey Road Studio Two is the Beatles studio. Basically, eighty you percent know, of their uh, catalog was recorded uh, in that room on that mixing desk in that control room. 
Um, and since 1980, Bowers and Wilkins have supplied the reference audio system for use in Studio 2. Um, and the connection there is that the Philips TV has a Bowers and Wilkins sound system on it, uh, which was developed by Bowers. So we get into that, a bit of that as well, and you'll see some nice footage of Studio 2 in the control room and so on. It was a, it was a fantastic day. Uh, actually spent some time myself and Jules sitting listening to the 801D4s, uh, three of them across the front soundstage there. Um, through that mixing desk, listening to the Beatles and other things through the actual desk, it was uh, quite the experience, wasn't it? It definitely was. I mean, just like the Starship Enterprise, you know, all the knobs and, you know, it was just, just <laughs> where would you even begin to tweak uh, with all those? It's, yeah, yeah. mesmerising. Yeah. You're asking the wrong question. Where would you possibly stop? It's the sing- <laughs> it is the single most tactile environment. Um, it's fa- fabulous. Just, yeah, just it is. And, totally knobs. And yeah, all interfaces should be like that. Yeah, I think a few of us have been lucky to be there a, a number of times, and it's it it never fails. As soon as you walk into that environment, it was your first time, Jules. It so was. Yeah, I, I might yeah. be talking rubbish here, but you walk yeah. into that building and you feel the history just. You yep. just feel it, don't you? It's, it's... Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's got that patina about it. It's really, it's not, it's not brand new, spanky new. It's all a little bit used, a bit, a bit shabby. But you can really imagine, you know, the Beatles there playing away and, and you know, taking you back to the sixties. Yeah. Great. Lond- London Philharmonic were in Studio One that day mm-hmm. as well. When were we were they? There. And, uh, wow. Yeah. Did you not hear them? <laughs> well, I knew I saw the light saying recording, but I didn't sort of peek my head around the corner. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, obviously famous if you're a film fan, lots of film scores Mm -hmm. uh, recorded there as well. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, That's the Philips stuff. Look out for the videos. It's coming very soon. In terms of TV stuff coming up, um, I have a TCL review uh, that I've been promising for a while. It is getting done. It's just kind of taking out a little bit of a backseat while lots of other things have been going on. But the C745 is coming very soon. Uh, It's a cracking TV. 650 quid. It's actually a lot cheaper than that now if you look around in some of the sales. Um, it's it's not mini LED or anything like that. It is a fold backlight on there. Um, it is an LCD TV. But if you're looking for something for gaming on or just something for a living room, um, these are cracking value. <laughs> Absolutely cracking value. Um, not for critical movie viewing. So don't go and sit in a dark room and say, Phil, what are you talking about? You've got raised blacks and clouding and blooming and all the rest of it. Yeah, we know that. Don't go and sit in a dark room. But if you're using it in a living room, as a workhorse, great TV. So the review coming up for that very soon. Of course, we've got our YouTube videos that I've just mentioned. They're all coming up uh, before Christmas as well. Um, so, yeah, lots of things happening. And again, Editor's Choice Awards. So we will have a TV section, a projector section. Not a lot happening in the projector se- section. And this is something we're going to talk about on our last podcast of the year. Our last big podcast of the year, not the Christmas special. Um, where are things going? Where, what's the trends? What's going to happen in 2024? When we started 20 years ago, um, with AV forums, it's a little bit more than twenty years ago. Um, you know, things have changed so much in in that time period um, in terms of technology, in terms of TV, in terms of projection and home theatre and all that kind of thing. So, where are we going next year? We're going to discuss that in the next podcast. If you've got any suggestions, if you've got anything you want to to cover on that, you know, is there bygone tech you want to see come back? Like three D always gets banged on a bit. Uh-huh. Um, people want to see that coming back. It's not going to happen, but you know. Uh, but where do you think we're going? You know, is projection now done because we can get 98 inch TVs for under five grand? You know, why would you go and spend money on a projector? Um, ultra shot through projectors, it's a lot of money. Um, do you not just go and buy a big screen TV? Uh, there's lots of these things happening at the minute. So we're going to cover that in the last podcast. So that's all coming up TV and display wise. Uh, but next we're going to go home cinema. If you'd like to support the AV Forums podcast on a regular basis, then why not become a patron? Head over to patreon.com forward slash AV Forums to sign up. You can send us a YouTube super chat or buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash AV Forums. All donations help us to improve the website and the podcasts. Thank you to all our supporters. Okay, so moving on to the home cinema section, we're going to get some reviews with Matt in a second. Bear. But first of all, Martin, you've had a a few bits and pieces in for review, so maybe you can bring us up to speed with what you've been looking at. Uh, yeah, I have, because there's been a, uh, I guess, a short lull of about uh, 10 days or two weeks between having anything published. But um, Majority, this Cambridge-based um, company, has released another slew of products, um, including soundbars and digital radios and other gizmos. And they're quite an interesting company because they are keeping their prices very low this soundbar that I've just looked at, which should be published in the next couple of days, um, is called the Majority Teton Plus. 
2.1 soundbar retails originally at 99 but it's already down to 94 pounds 50 but i would say don't write this thing off you know in this cash strapped age um a lot of people you know struggling with a little less cash in their pockets and it might be worth looking at some of these more uh budget uh models um i do have some criticisms of it you'll have to read my review it's not perfect by any means um and i did prefer the creative um uh v2 which we thought was very impressive for the money that's also about 100 pounds but anyway yes please go and take a look at that i've also got uh which has just arrived a little speaker made by german company sonora it's called the Foller oscar and this is actually a detachable speaker that detaches from its uh, charging station and if you're hard of hearing you can actually place it close to you on a sofa arm or something like that but just some initial impressions taking it out of the packaging it's absolutely beautifully manufactured this thing so i'm very interested to take a look at that i've also got a uh, subwoofer coming in from uh, jbl this jbl stage 120p uh, this is what we'd consider a budget subwoofer at £399. It's a ported sub um, and a 13-inch driver and 250 watts of onboard power. What I'm possibly most looking forward to, though, is the Lingdorf MXA 8400 eight-channel power amplifier, eight times 400 watts into four ohms, I believe, if I'm I right. I love the that. juxtaposition there. We're talking about 99 yes. bars and then all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's an interesting spread for sure so. yes, yes it is bit. yes <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm definitely at both uh ends of the spectrum here sorry so if i blindsided you there but um my understanding is that this new lingdorf amplifier uh although class d purify eigentat uh amplifier modules which have been customized by lingdorf my understanding is that it sounds incredibly like a class a b design um also got the emotiva mr 1L, which is 13 point chan 13.2 channel receiver with nine channels of amplification on board. And Storm Audio, we were going to look at the PA16, but that was reviewed by uh, Steve Withers, the Mark II. Turns out the Mark III only has a cosmetic um, upgrade on the outside, so nothing going on on the inside. So we may take a look at their 20 channel receiver which well, is I the think be a bit of interest in that. Yeah, I think yeah. some people will be interested in that one. It's only 20 it's grand as well. 20 so, you know. channels. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 20. Two 20. zero. Yeah, that's correct. 20, cha yes. 20 channels but, and it's a, it, it, yeah. Yeah, it's a thousand pound a channel, basically. Oh, bargasm. Yeah. I'll have three. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for that, Martin. Uh, lots of good reviews there. Uh, oh, pro interesting products. 99 quid all the way up to Martin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all, all the way up to twenty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Right, uh, Matt. So uh, Matt introduced himself at the beginning of the podcast. Uh, your role, uh, basically, with, with AV Forms going forward, is going to be looking at multi-channel uh, speaker systems as well as other things that, that take your interest uh, in that sphere. But you've had a look at two big speaker packages, uh, mainly because we would need you to get some through for the awards season coming soon, and uh, we haven't had. I think people out there don't actually realize how hard and difficult it is. and ed will back me up on this to review a multi-channel system um just mm. the packaging alone that these systems coming uh the the weight especially if it's got a subwoofer or two um the amount of input I, I mean i'm telling you this matt can tell you tell you this he, he's now uh, a veteran when it comes to these systems um how did you find that side before we get into the rest of it how did you find that side actually having to deal with these huge systems coming into your home. Oh, yeah. Well, first, I mean, I was excited. I was telling my wife, she probably got sick of hearing about it after the weekend because you get the delivery notice and I'm just like, hey, they're coming, they're coming. She's like, yeah, it's okay. So I'm like a kid at a candy shop, right? You know, and it was about Halloween, the first one. So my kids are all excited because they're high on sugar and I'm all excited because I'm high on hi-fi. <laughs> but no, it was, it was really good. Um, that side is a bit is a bit different. Like you said, it's, uh, you know, you're in for a treat when the delivery men are a little reluctant to take it off the truck for you. Can I suggest that you tip them at Christmas? It makes an enormous yeah. <laughs> it makes an enormous difference to their ongoing levels of enthusiasm and their well, medical that, fees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think I need to hire a dolly. I think because I think some of these other bigger subwoofers and stuff, when you get up above the fifteen inches, and I mean, like I look at my Arendel, and to move that out of the way to get the anther in, it almost makes you not want to bother. 
<laughs> ways. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's like two humans um, in a cube. So, but it was yeah. it was good. It, I, around the packaging too, that was another thing that you you underestimate because as a reviewer and not as a sole purchaser, because as a sole purchaser you get it and it's like Christmas, right? And you just rip the boxes open and you throw the fluff all over the place and you don't really think about any of that. But as a reviewer, you got to keep it in the back of your head that you got to send this thing back. So if you tear into that box, you got to put that all back together and it becomes a bit of a bit of a Jenga set, really. So you take, take photos think, uh, as you extract it. Um, yeah, I think it, uh, myself and Ed, we've, we've, we've mentioned this before. We should really start a TV program called The Krypton Factor where, you know, Gordon just assesses us on taking the kit out of the box, but then repackaging it again, because mm. um, it can get to the point where you've packaged everything the way you think it goes in. That, that last bit of polystyrene just sticks out that ever so slightly at the top of the box and you can't get the top flat and yeah. you've got to take it all out again to fi figure out it again. So. Yeah. Yeah, that happened to be on the first set. Yeah, I went to put the floor stander in and forgot one little bit and then had to take <laughs> the thing out and redo it all. And, you know, I, I think I forgot to put the grill in first before you put the sheath over it and it's all, yeah. But it yeah, does yeah. give me a whole different appreciation for the people that put those boxes together and the logistics side of that. It's, it's, on, it's a little thing. It has nothing to do with the product, but yet as an experience, it, it does make a difference. It's one of those things I've given up whinging about packaging in reviews um because it's such a niche thing it's it's essentially a first the first of first world problems um but nevertheless the the, the field of difference between two identically priced products in how much thought has gone into how it's going to come out of the box and also in, in many cases how it's going to go both back into the box it's very very significant um and one of these days i'm going to meet someone who was responsible for either the design or the implementation of the packaging for the Sony Net MD Walkmans. And they will be easy to spot because they will have three arms. Um, because honestly, I've never seen anything like it. They, the moment that you popped the first flap on the box of those, it exploded like the Hellraiser puzzle box. Um, <laughs> and after that, everything else has seemed relatively benign. So, And the other, I, I don't know if any of you had experience or a lot of experience of opening up soundbar boxes, but if they yeah. have subwoofers in them as well, and they have these ex this extraordinary sort of layout, mm. and then trying to get into the uh, things, knowing yeah. where, where the actual uh, door opens is a challenge in itself anyway. Yeah, I no, rebox no. record players, so I'd just like to throw that out there as a particular, <laughs> okay, yeah. a particular yeah, form yeah. of... Uh, try 65-inch uh, try TVs on your own. Uh -huh. Maybe, maybe should we just do? Should we just rotate <laughs> one stage round for one set of reviews? You know, I'll I'll stare confusedly at a television, and we'll send we'll send record players out to random people, and it'll yeah. be, it'll be brilliant. Why not? Why not? Yeah. Anyway, let's get back to that. So it's one of these sites because you're a new reviewer. I want you to try and get that across to people out there that maybe they don't appreciate. Um, you know, where do you put uh -huh. these boxes? Where do you put the kit? And 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 all that kind of thing when it comes through. But anyway, you've had two big systems. Um, let's start with the monitor audio. How how did you get on with the goals? Yeah, so they were they were. Um, I was really interested in those ones because of the tweeter design. So they use a ribbon tweeter in the gold series, which is quite a bit different than what I've got in my reference setup. So I've got some Crix forty fives on the side with soft dome, and then I've got some aluminium tweeters in the front that are um, definitive technology. So it's and I knew I've got some near field Atom speakers that I do for sometimes when I like to pretend to be a DJ. Um, and I, I, they've got a ribbon tweeter in them. So I kind of had an idea of what they were going to do with like a depth of sound stage. And this is something that I tried to start all my reviews. So if you go and check out the review, I've, I've posted, I try and do a measurement, just a quick sweep, nothing special, just to give you guys an idea of what I'm hearing when I'm trying to talk about it. But that's something that's very hard to show in a measurement, the depth of field that you get out of these things. And that's what I thought was amazing. So I traditionally, I've got these deaf tech bipolar towers, which you know, they got a speaker in the back of them that fires backwards and forwards to create this big sound stage. So I'm quite used to that. But on these golds, that ribbon tweeter pretty much emulated that without creating all the negative things of a bipolar bouncing it all off all your walls. So that was cool. Um, and then aesthetically, talk about wife acceptance factor. I mean, that thing, I wasn't joking in the review when I said you could set that next to a piano. Um, that ebony finish on those, I thought was really nice. Um, and then I think more importantly, the the Anthra sub, because I know that some of the reviewers had made some comments on it after I posted about like the W series being a bit weak in that. Um, but what I, the Anthras were essentially they use the CCAM driver. It's just a bigger version than what they've got on the towers. So it's just, but there's something I probably should have taken a photo of. But the the cone on that 
Um, so for those of you that know like Pro Listen, where you got that checkered pattern, um, and then you've got in the bowers that we'll get to the continuum cone, which has its own little effect. These CCAM ones, it's like these really little honeycomb looking things. It's almost, uh, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's it, it almost gets you in a little bit of a, like if you look too close at it, you just want to play with the light a bit. So I obsessed with that for about five minutes before I even turned the things on. Um, but what I found most impressive about that sub, which maybe didn't show through in the review enough, was they've got this app, which normally apps are, I don't know, take it or leave it depending on how useful they are. But this one, if you look at the the difference that you could do with the EQ, I mean, I literally only took 10 minutes and got what I would consider almost similar results to if I were to use my mini DSP to try and get there. But the difference was, is the ease of use of that app. I probably take, you know, like, like I said, it was 10 minutes when I could have easily dropped two hours into trying to do the same thing with the mini DSP. So the, for somebody who's not as much of an enthusiast on the detailed, you know, turning the knobs, like Ed was saying, you know, if it's got a knob, you want to turn it. If you're not that type of person, but you still want to have some configurability, that app gave a tremendous amount of that. And I thought that was really good, a really good thing to see in that. Granted, the price point on that Anthra, I think some people probably walked away after they saw the price of it, but you could see where some of that money was going just in the app investment alone. There's an argument as well that um, Monitor Audio, there, there's nothing to be gained from a brand like Monitor Audio trying to out SVS, SVS. If you're yeah. going to go to the effort of producing your subwoofers in-house, they, they have to have a, you know, a USP of their own. And this strikes me as a perfectly sensible one. Um, if it's going to facilitate, I was about to say normal people, but normal people wouldn't buy them in the first place. If it's going to facilitate the less than totally committed owner getting more than respectable performance out of it, that's the exploitable niche and it makes perfect sense. I totally agree. Totally agree. And as far as the performance of the thing, I mean, I had it in a, my room's quite large. So it is, I mean, a 10 is probably unfair to put in that room, but it worked quite well. And it never, uh, cause I, with any new subwoofer, and obviously it was one of my first ones to really take a crack at. So I did all the normal torture tests to it where you, you throw on uh, Oblivion and the other Tom Cruise film where it goes down to stupid low in the beginning and all that kind of stuff in the eye opening scene and all those in, uh, Blade Runner 2049. And I was surprised at how well the sub reacted to that. Never overextended, never made any weird noises. There's never any weird resonances or like bloated feeling. Um, I don't know. I, I like to compare subwoofers to like slamming a car door. You can kind of tell the quality of them. So like if you slam a Astra door compared to if you slam a BMW door, you, you just kind of know the quality in the build just by how it sounds when it makes that thud. It was, it was kind of this way without that subwoofer, I'd say. Excellent. Um, so if anybody wants to get more in depth, obviously, uh, match review is up there for the monitor gold, uh, audio gold, sorry, uh, speakers and the new sub. Uh, so go and have a look at that and check that out. Um, and wrapping up on your stuff, uh, Bowers and Wilkins. So the new 600 S3s, 600s, I remember oh, early 90s, I bought my first pair of uh, six or twos, I think I bought back then. Um, with the original uh, Kevlar drivers in them, yellow drivers and so on. And uh, the, the, Ed, they've been a, a model that has been around a long time and now on to Series 3. So you looked at the 6 or 6, is that correct? I did and handed it an Editor's Choice Award, no less. Yeah, excellent. So we were keen. A lot of people out there, it's the first entry point in the Bowers, um, the 600 series. They've always been popular as a multi-channel system um, and, and an entry point. So what did you think, Matt? Did they live up to you know previous history? Are they adding anything new this time around? Well, as an entry set, I thought they were fantastic, quite honestly. I mean, and we talk about, you know, the economical crunch and, and people trying to save pennies and things. and to me, the price point didn't really match what these offered. Um, I, I just thought they were really, just really good. And it was, I mean, obviously I had these, so I went from the ribbon tweeters on the monitor audio golds one week to then swapping it all out for this BMW and they use a titanium tweeter, which was an interesting implementation. So you can see that above the, the cone there. And then you got the continuum driver that sits below that. It's that silvery, like my wife said, it looked like one of those skirts from the 19 whatevers that girls used to wear when they go out, that real <laughs> aluminum foil looking stuff. Um, bit, bit of space age stuff, but the way they implemented that, and I think Ed, was it you that did that review on the six Oh sixes, right? Yes. I just thought it was, I, 
you know, sometimes people talk about like true sound or whatever. And again, you can go look at the measurements and that, but I, I just thought that these were, it, it did sound true as corny as that is. Yeah, no, I was absolutely, um, absolutely prepared mentally for this being a for the 606 s3 being a breathed on version of the s2 it would have some detailed improvements and you know well done bells and wilkins stays competitive so on and so forth it doesn't look that different to the one that came before but it's genuinely outstanding um it is the the jump in performance is very very significant it's in what i would be interested and i shamefully i haven't actually yet written, read your full review on this what i'm most interested in especially given the nature of where we where our reviewing sort of uh exercises differ in so far as you can calibrate down and you can be shooting for you know an actual measurable baseline um the one thing I found that Bose and Wilkins has rediscovered in the last couple of years is that they're still, it's now fun. I mean, I can't measure fun, but I know it when I hear it. Um, was Is that same sort of general sense of joy present when you've got five, six, seven of them in the room? Because it's definitely present when there's two of them. Yeah. Yeah. So then that happened to me, actually. I wrote about it a little bit, but there was an, uh, I think it was an Evanescence cover that came on which was an older song that I used to like back when I was in high school or whatever. So that kind of dates me a bit, but um, anyways, this, this quartet redid it and I listened to it the first time. And another thing I kind of really liked about the Bowers is you could just keep turning them up. I don't know if you did that with the 606. I just kept turning them up and I did. And I just kept going and going and going and going. And then I really listened to that one. And to me, I, I know what you're saying. I like to get a, you know, they're good when you start to get that emotional response where yes. you just where you feel it. I, it sounds corny and I don't mean feel it as in like the below 20 hertz like shaking your guts feel it I mean like you have an emotional reaction to what's going on and it kind of just moves you as, yes. as soft as that may make me sound but that's, no, no, that's what perfect happened. perfect sense from this end so yeah yeah um and it's good it's it is in uh, in invigorating um to to find that it's do that they're doing that when you've got multiple ones of them in the same room as well and they are calibrated and you know i don't for, be, believe for a second that there's any inaccuracies creeping in you know this is still a company which has you know developed a, re a reputation for being in abbey road and things like that but nevertheless there is a palpable joy to what they're doing at the moment which wasn't necessarily there five years ago and um i'm delighted that it's made it it's it's, it's still extant in the multi-channel side of it as well yeah, well, and one of the other side benefits for those viewers that do like to watch material with their partners, it was probably one of the first times that my partner didn't ask, what did they just say? Right? Mm -hmm. Which is like the ever annoying thing, right? Because it's like, because then you end up explaining the movie to and then you miss the next line or whatever. But that that didn't happen. So I thought the, the like the vocal clarity on the center, which I know some people again on the reviews dogged about the size of the cones because they essentially they matched the um, five and a quarters or the five inch which with the surrounds instead of matching the six and a halfs in the front which was a little bit of a different design choice um but it didn't affect the the job of the center channel in this case and that was that was to me it was really impressive because that was the first thing i noticed when i took it out of the box i'm like man this thing's a bit a wee bit small really um but it didn't have any effect on the actual experience which was good how were the surrounds um did you have them to the side or rear behind you yes to the side to the side okay, yeah, yeah. I got a bit of a weird room where um, my seat is, a. Uh, I got a pool table behind me, so it makes sense for me to have them on the sides. And that was one of the other things, like I, I think I said in the review, I listened to Tenant, and there's a particular gunshot in that that I don't remember, because uh, I haven't watched the film in a while. But again, I had it cranked up because it was Tenant, and this gunshot hit, and I was surprised at how much those five inches can throw something at you, it, scarily, really. I mean, it, I move my head and whatever, I'm quite a jumpy movie watcher anyways, but yeah it definitely has that good effect and and they integrated well with the fronts did they yeah well that was the thing that it was interesting because they use the same titanium domes as the center and the same size cones it's, except they're just single so it creates this like triangle effect and then you've got your your stereo towers that are the six and a half so they got a little bit more grunt to them so i thought that that was you can kind of tell that bowers is coming from the musical angle on that right so it's it's catering to the group that's going to use the the stereo listening and you get a little bit more out of the towers and those three are going to be shut off anyway and then you can quite quickly switch it over to the 5.1 and there's no timber mismatch or power mismatch really when it's when it's panning around because there's quite a few films that i watched for that reason to like kind of say because again i 
I look at the size of a speaker and I go, right, displacement should win. But it, it kind of defied that a bit, which was good. Yeah. Matt, Just... and, and one for Ed as well. It, you know, quite a bit of finger pointing, certainly in the past, towards Bowers in terms of being too bright of a speaker, too sibilant sometimes and so on. How are they handling it this time? It, you know, the S3s, I've, I've heard the 700 series, I've heard the 800s. 600s, I haven't heard this uh, iteration of them. So, so how do they handle things? I, from my perspective, from a two-channel perspective, unless you go out of your way to find something actively intriguingly bright, I don't think it would be uh, the issue it once was. The interesting thing is, <clears throat> and we're at the very limits of my technical understanding here, the perceived brightness from Bowers and Wilkins, it was never necessarily the tweeter that was misbehaving. It was the hard edge that crept in as the Kevlar driver reached its upper registers. And that was um, effectively nullified um, when they moved to continuum and they've only got better at integrating that continuum from there. Um, they, I mean, I'm sure that somebody out there will get a sound out of them, which is too forward, but you have to work at it. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I think some of the, you know, material choice as well, like if you're choosing something, like you say, if there's nails on a chalkboard, well, that's what, you know, Bauer says that's what it's supposed to sound like. So they're not going to, you know, they're not going to dull the person's nails on the chalkboard, are they? They're going to let that show through. So some of it's material choice as well. Yeah, no, I just think it's a, an important point because it's one that gets bandied around quite a bit on on forums and so on. Um, certainly with previous iterations i think the the s2s were um frowned upon but in some quarters because well they yeah things. you could i that would to be honest the s2s and the anniversaries it was more <clears throat> some parts of it felt it felt perhaps that certain parts of it had been updated and other parts had you know soldiered on for a bit longer and as a it wasn't didn't necessarily run as mm -hmm. a cohesive whole but i think across a vast majority of speaker brands actually most companies seem to have got a little bit softer I mean, I can think back to a time when Monitor Audios, we, we packaged it previously, Monitor Audio Golds, if you didn't partner them carefully, they were vicious. And ever since they've um, moved to that um, uh, ribbon and then the thing that looks like a high frequency accordion, um, however odd they look, they work sublimely. And it's now relatively hard to provoke a Monitor Audio as well. Interestingly, if you are looking for a speaker which can be provoked into being significantly forward, I've got one of those turning up. Well, the review for it will be going live in December. So you can uh, have a look at that. One of the most expensive speakers we've ever reviewed as well. So, you know, make of that what you will. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Matt. Um, and no, uh, I've just realized my, my, my shirt's the same as your, your background there. Just noticed that. All anyway. Sorry, what's that, Ed? Oh. Ed's crashed. Ed's crashed, has he? Ah, okay, very good. I can oh, hear yes. you. Ah, sorry. Got, I'm, yeah. I'm get... Oh, you had me panicking there. <laughs> no, no, I've got, I've, got the, the, I've got the um, your <laughs> connection is unstable message now, so I'm obviously having... It's uh, moustache looking okay. back to the 70s yes, for a moment. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like after, so. uh, but anyway, thank you, Matt. Uh, like I say, Matt's reviews are up there on uh, AV Forums. Go check them out and uh, leave your comments in those threads uh, or leave your comments underneath this podcast uh, wherever you're watching it or viewing it right uh, we're going to hi-fi next and hopefully ed's going to be here <laughs> if you enjoy the podcast on youtube then please like and subscribe if you're listening to the audio version then please leave us a rating on your podcast app we invite you to email questions and feedback to podcast at avforums.com and join in with this episode's discussion thread in the podcasts forum at AV Forums. Right then, um, hi-fi section. Thank you to everyone else. Um, do continue to chip in as and when. Um, right, uh, in a bit, I will very, very briefly um, uh, just say 10 words about the editor's choice uh, and uh, we'll discuss uh, the uh, singing hot plate uh, that is the musical fidelity a1 but we have some news stories to begin with um, and before we get stuck into things that are quite expensive uh, whim audio has launched something which looks to be tremendous value doesn't it ian uh yeah well we hope so um obviously the company's made quite a, a splash of late with a series of streamers that have been doing very very good things in very affordable packages and they are set to launch their own Wim amp in the, the very near future. It's priced at £299, which is something of a high point for the company, but obviously relatively low in the, the, the grander scheme of things. 
Uh, it comes with Class D amplification, offering up to 60 watts per channel into eight ohms. Uh, it covers most of the usual suspects in terms of connections and compatibility, obviously including wireless support to help the streaming side of things, plus is access to the Wim Home app and all of your favorite streaming platforms. Uh, and you, hopefully if it can match the, the company's previous offerings, then it, uh, we should be expecting very good things from it as well. I'm expecting very good things from it. I've got a review sample um, on order. Um, should be with us, uh, hopefully, to get through uh, in December to go live in January. Um, the other thing, of course, uh, that Ian didn't mention there that's going to make uh, win friends and influence people uh, is that it's got HDMI arc as well. So if you're looking as a means of uh, basically providing a one-stop solution to bolstering the sound of your TV just by adding a pair of speakers on either side of it, if this is anything like as good as the streamers are, it's going to be pretty damn good, isn't it? pounds so um yeah we've got one of those on order please don't worry about it i will get it through as soon as i can um uh, also a company that generally does uh, some rather good value things iFi has um been at the, the 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 more sort of spendy end of what they do with the diablo 2 is that right uh yeah i've just seen a lot of similarly good things in very small packages from iFi audio late um yeah, the IDSD Diablo 2 DAC slash headline amplifier uh, is is out now. It comes with a price tag of £1,299, which does obviously put it sort of more, well, it's now in the mid-range of uh, iFi Audio's range when you've got like, the likes of the ICANN Phantom, uh, the, the top tier of the scale. Um, but yeah, it, it, obviously it's a, a sequel to the original Diablo. Uh, it comes with an equally striking red design to match the name. Uh, it comes with XMEMS or XMEMS Solid State Micro speaker technology it's also updated with bluetooth 5.4 and aptex lossless support and a, a whole lot more so uh, i mean seems to be a lot of good reaction towards the previous diablo so hopefully even better things from this one yes it, it's um it's likely to be very very good um <clears throat> i've actually got two iFi I reviews um in the tank they will go live at some point there is the um uh, idsd2 neo so the sort of uh, desktop uh, DAC rather than the portable one, um, and the HIP DAC 3, which is tiny and extremely good. Um, in the interest of getting other people's opinions in on this, I think it is likely that it will be Mr. Simon Lucas that takes a look at this for us, so we can have a bit of plurality of opinion, um, which I think is a good idea. Um, we won't be reviewing this, but it is uh, a relatively interesting thing, uh, because uh, Project is now old enough to start mining its past, isn't it, Ian? Yes, yeah, obviously the company seems to have had quite an affinity with special edition turntables over, over the years, putting out a lot of sort of eye-catching uh, models of late. Um, and it now seems to be looking to add uh, what they're calling the final edition uh, lineup to its ranks, starting with the perspective turntable. Uh, as the final edition name suggests, this uh, seems like it's going to be like a last hurrah for some of their classic models from the years gone by, with this particular model's perspective dating back to the 1990s. Um, so what it gets kind of a Farewell tour with a stylish new look with a see through acrylic plinth and a number of obviously suitably modernized upgrades coming to it. Um, it does come with a price tag of £1,299, so quite an expensive trip down memory lane, perhaps. But it does that money does get you a few nice extra bonus features, including a pack with your name on it. And who wouldn't want that? Exactly. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, the uh, weird fact the first turntable I ever sold in a hi fi dealer was a perspective. Um, so, um, yes, that's a, uh, a, um, a, a going to be an interesting thing, but because it's in relatively limited numbers, uh, we won't be looking at that, but it will be very, very good. Um, and finally, something that I do hope that we can look at, but, um, Rotel in the UK, it's a bit of a, a weird area at the moment. That's a conversation for another time, but nevertheless, they have unveiled, um, a very, very interesting looking stereo amplifier. Yeah, it comes, um, slightly more of the slightly more larger and uh, more expensive than the wind one we talked about earlier. Uh, but they've uh, launched the RAS 5000, which, as you say, is a stereo amplifier. Uh, it comes with Class A-B amplification that can power up to 220 watts per channel into uh, four ohms. It comes with an eye on the home entertainment market as well as just the music scene. Um, obviously, as you expect, it comes with like integrated steaming technology, the likes of Spotify and Tidal. There's a premium 32-bit ESS DAC in there uh, and a power supply that they uh, has been custom made for ultra low noise uh, apparently i'm very much trusting their word on this but hopefully you'll be able to get it in for review and tell us better but yeah that comes with a price tag of two thousand seven hundred ninety nine pounds and if it's not out already it should be launching imminently yes um there's as i say it's a bit, a bit of an odd one at the moment for the uk for rotel but um nevertheless this looks very very interesting rotel never usually 
were exactly at the bleeding edge of technology. It was very much tried and trusted stuff, but this looks to be rather more sophisticated. So if we can get it in, I'll see what we can do. Um, right, uh, Phil mentioned it earlier. Editor's Choice for Hi-Fi has gone first this year. Um, that's just down to the fact I think I got, um, I had enough products sort of done for things to actually go, go through. Um, the winners are up. You can have a look on the site. You can disagree with them vigorously and, and, and see what you think. I welcome the feedback. We're interested to see what you make of the decisions that we've made. Um, literally, the only things that's worth bringing up at this very early point before we plow through them all. Um, Hi-Fi, we cover enough products across the year that n we don't roll over. Um, everything is judged on what is the best thing we've seen this year. Um, so certain categories come and go. There's no high-end turntable this year, for example. We didn't look at one. We looked at more affordable things for the most part. Um, so that is so, so awards come and awards go, but it's broadly speaking, uh, you know, a, a widespread of things. Um, the decisions were largely uh, i mean I, I i sent them to phil and he had the opportunity to disagree vigorously with any of them but didn't which is um very nice of him um so those decisions were largely reached by me but i had them signed off um I, i'm hoping that there's nothing terribly contentious there really that we looked at a a huge number of very very good products this year we we doled out you know reluctantly i doled out more tens this year than i had in any previous year um, and the quality of the stuff that we looked at is extremely high. As I've said before, we tend to curate. We don't get stuff through in unless we think it's going to be pretty good. It, life is too short to spend reviewing in different items. So that's reflected in the quality of these things. Um, that is how it was done. It's all this year. Um, it's been up since noon. It seems to be attracting a lot of attention. I'm very pleased about that. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions about the decisions that have been reached, put them in the comments and I'll do my best to justify why I reached the decisions that I did. So that's Ed, yes. one thing I, I, I want to draw from this and, and hopefully other people see this as well. That And, and it's touching back on what, what we were saying earlier in the podcast, and that is where we're heading uh, when it comes to AV, when it comes to hi-fi, when it comes to you know everything that we are interested in as a, as a group here and as a community on AV forums, and it's it's really interesting looking through twenty nine awards was it this year something like that yes Couldn't um, quite make it to third. really interesting to see just the breadth when you're talking about hi fi, and you know previously Matt might agree with this Matt might agree with this when I, if I said hi fi to our generation you're thinking separate box maybe two or three items and a pair of speakers. And we're so far removed from that nowadays in mm. terms of what we're looking at in terms of a product here, aren't we? Yes. I mean, it, essentially, it, to the extent where we have to break down how we award amplifiers, because on the one hand, we've got our product of the year. We've got the Riga LX Mark IV, which by Riga standards is quite sophisticated. It's got two digital inputs, but it can't legitimately be judged in the same sense that we look at the Yamaha RN2000A, which has got many digital inputs, HDMI arc, streaming, automatic calibration. So we have to be realistic about how we break these things down and yes hi-fi is a weird in a weird state where we have products that do more than ever before but they are supported to do their niche functions by the a wider range of different categories than at any stage than when i've been interested in hi-fi it is a truly weird and wonderful time to be interested in two channel audio right now and, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm delighted that so many of you are along for the ride. Um, something that obviously does keep cropping up in comments, and I don't want to make a big thing about this. We will be looking, we'd have looked at this year, and we will be continuing to look at items which cost quite a lot of money. Now, um, everyone's perception of worth is a little bit different on this, and it's the same across so many different things. I have no interest in spending an enormous amount of money on a handbag, for example. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I, I'm not going to plead for, uh, you know, a, a complete change of perception. We, you know, the, the nature of the forums is you state your opinion and you make your case. I just would like people to perhaps make it to the end of the review before your fingers hit the key. <laughs> see where we go with that. See if you can give me that as an idea and we'll take it from there. But yes, um, that's editor's choice. As I say, it'll be up there. We'll talk about it in more depth in a bit. Now, the product that I wanted to talk about for the single review um, is um, 
the uh the Mon musical fidelity a1 which is not in the editor's choice category it is not won an award and this has confused someone legitimately because i gave it nine out of ten as an overall review and ten out of ten for sound quality um and this is reflected in a comment that matt made earlier and it's made it reflected in the nature of two channel and all of its weirdness and wonderfulness this is an outstanding amplifier to listen to there's nothing under two grand that i personally me ed selly mustache would rather own than this amplifier however i have to be legitimate and and, and realistic in my critique of this amplifier when i compare it to its key competition um it's a funny looking thing uh look it's a subjective but I, it's not going to appeal to everybody uh, it runs like an oven. You cannot put something on top of this amplifier for any length of time. It will be baked. And I, I, I'm not emphasizing this for dramatic effect. When you open the box, it has a hot surface warning label as the first thing that you see when you open the box. The casework routinely runs at 60 degrees or over. On a day like this, it's fabulous. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. not so good in the summer. The casework is designed to channel a huge amount of heat away from the constantly active output stage and uh, stop the amplifier from baking itself. And that does mean that I don't believe that this is ever going to class it, qualify for a decent energy rating. Um, it has no digital inputs. Uh, the remote has three buttons on it. Um, there are any number of things that are wrong with it, which is why I cannot objectively say this is the best amplifier you should buy for under £2,000. However, if you can put all of the impracticalities to one side, if you just want to sit down and listen to it with sensitively partnered source and loudspeakers, it is an unadulterated joy. And for a number of people, that's all that's going to matter. And I thoroughly enjoyed writing the review. The review is the best part of 3,000 words long because I had to try and make sense of this weird little box. Um, but yes, the comment section reflects the fact that some people, some people are going, that's demented. And some people are legitimately pointing out that if it runs like an oven, I mean, you know, what's the longevity like? And well, that other was going to be my question. Other people saying, well, I own one from the 1980s and it's still running. So the jury's out on that but they've put a lot of effort into making this more robust than the than the original and it's absolutely wonderful to listen to i cannot stress how entertaining it is so that is the, this is exactly what matt's talking was talking about earlier it's in terms of that moment of emotional engagement this thing delivers in spades and for a number of people that is all that is going to matter and if you're shopping at this price point, take on board my concerns about it. Go and have a listen, and a number of you will go, Riga, what Riga, NAD, what NAD. You will, the only amplifier that you'll want to buy is this one. So that is why it's here. It's highly recommended. I didn't give it a best buy. Well, if, if anything, Ed, you've intrigued me to go and have a listen to one of these now yeah, and get the opportunity to. So It's uh, utterly wonderful. The combination of that and the Neat Petite Classic, Oh, it's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. So, yeah, I absolutely cannot recommend it highly enough, except the fact that I have to be guarded in recommendation because there's a number of things it does that are, for some people, mildly concerning. That mm. is two-channel audio in all of its wonderful glory. Um, in terms of other things in their wonderful glory, I have been finishing off a clutch of items. Uh, they should be uploaded, Phil, I think the 1st of December, if I'm being honest with myself, not okay. the 30th of November. Um, obviously, Edison's Choice is already up. We have got a very large pair of loudspeakers from Triangle. We have got a very small pair of loudspeakers that look like a very large pair of loudspeakers from Fine Audio. Um, the Eversolo DMP A8. I know a number of people are rather keen to read that review. It is written. Um, it has not one, but two contentious statements in it. I warn you now. Um, and then I am most of the way through currently writing the long form Christmas review. Um, I pop this on Instagram and so on and so forth. This is the Riga Naya, the flagship turntable from Riga, 12 and a half thousand pounds. Um, and because Riga has very generously let a Planer 10 live here for some years, they're set up next to each other. And unless you know what you're looking for, they appear to be two identical turntables, but one of them is more than twice the price of the other. Um, so, yeah, I've got to explain why. Is it worth it? How can that possibly be the case? Um, it will oh, no, be I'm just, long. I'm just baffled that the other one's six grand. 
Well, okay, you don't buy you don't buy Riga products for weight. I will say that um, they you know they are dinky little things. The more time you spend with them, the cleverer you realise that they are. Um, but yes, uh, I'm I would say I'm no more than twenty five percent the way through, and we're north of a thousand words. So it's going to be a big old review. Yeah, it's, it's um, so if you one. are going to try and hide from your family on Christmas Day, <laughs> um, I, I will be doing my best to give you something to hide and 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 plough through there. So yeah, that's what we've got um, coming up. All that is left for me to do at this point is to talk about album and vinyl. They are separate this week. Um, album of the week. I need to make sure I get this the right way round. Um, <laughs> this was a bit of a surprise. Uh, the album is Vince Clark. Uh, he of Eurasia and originally Depeche Mode. And he released an album called Songs of Silence. And if you are expecting it to sound like Eurasia or Depeche Mode, Mm, I've got some news for you, and it's it's not going to be... It, well, it depends how much you want it to sound like that. Um, he recorded this largely during lockdown using new software and new equipment that he had both helped to develop and then brought in. Um, I think this album is absolutely astonishing. Um, it's electronic. It's largely existing. There are real instruments interspersed with it. There's an old Durham mining song interspersed with it at one point. Uh, I can't stop listening to it. I think it is absolutely astonishing to listen to. Um, it's gone straight into test material because some of it goes seriously low and seriously loud with serious dynamics. Um, I will hopefully be picking up on vinyl, uh, but it is my album because I think it's a more general thing. I think it is a truly interesting thing. If you are from the boards of canada end of things you've also enjoyed the recommendations about marconi union and people like that this is going to be very very long way up your street i think it's absolutely brilliant and i cannot recommend it highly enough if however you don't want to listen to electronic droning um vinyl but could, it's all on all the major streaming services as well the third album by um an act called ghost woman it's called hindsight is 50 50. um ghost woman i've given the nod to their first album as an album of the podcast as well it's semi-retro it's scuzzy grungy real instrumental instrument work and i think it's absolutely brilliant it's dark it's brooding and it's got some damn good tunes on it um i wouldn't say it's a recording for the ages but i bought the first album on vinyl and it sounds pretty good so it's here because i wanted to talk about two albums and it's on vinyl as well i've got my copy on order um, because it is the 27th of November and not December, the playlist is not a Christmas playlist because we don't listen to Christmas music in November, do we? Um, <laughs> the playlist is on Spotify. It's called Winter Chill 2023. Uh, it's one of those ones that you can pop on if you're simply wanting to drop the world out whilst you're moving around and you've finished listening to the AV Forms podcast, or you'd like to concentrate, get your head down, do some work. So it's not epoch making but as i say i cannot in good conscience give you a christmas playlist yet and at the moment most of the streaming services have pivoted over to endless christmas playlists so those are the recommendations that is the hi-fi section uh i thank you yeah excellent thank you ed well wow. uh well there's a few things there i'm going to go and listen to um and i'm traveling tomorrow so uh, i'll have to download some of those and, and listen to them martin if you're speaking you're on mute um so yeah uh you had something to say ed could i possibly ask you something about the vince clark album so yes in my opinion he was very much the genius in the you know in erasure and those songs yes. that did work were amazing yeah is, is there any of that sort of very intelligent sort of progression of you know sort of chord like progressions and uh intrigue that he inserted and maybe needed to explore a bit further Yes, but it's happening a great deal slower. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so yes, uh, no, the man hasn't lost his touch, not at all. But this is this. He didn't intend to release this, but a friend of his got listening to it. Then the re his record label got listening to it and said, "Yeah, other people need to hear this." And I completely agree with them. It is not. It's not come out as uh, part of you know listed anything to do with Eurasia it's not come out as being anything other than an interesting project that he attended to during 2020 and 2021 um but I think it's it's just it's one of my very favorite albums of this year coming in right at the end it's not quite my album of the year but my word it's it, it's close it's bloody bloody good so yeah give it a listen Martin see what you think yeah, it's not definitely. just go into it not expecting any immediate nods to what he's better known for yep 
definitely. Yeah, not interested, and in, uh, that's going to be uh, downloading the list tomorrow. Right. Um, thank you very much, Ed, for the, the hi fi section, as always. All right. So I just need to tell you what's coming up podcast wise, because as Ed alluded to, we're end in November, so we're heading into December. Uh, you have three podcasts left this year. The next podcast is the movies edition. It'll be here on Monday, the 4th of December. It starts at half past eight. If you want to watch the guys live, it will be the last live movies podcast. Um, so you head over there, half past eight, uh, on YouTube on Monday, the 4th of December for the guys doing the movies podcast. And then this podcast will be back on the 11th of December. And again, it'll be our last live uh, edition of the podcast. And there's lots to get through uh, on that podcast. So we've got CES to talk about, um, that big show that happens in January. I am going again uh, this coming uh, January. So we'll get through that. Uh, we're talking about some other bits and pieces, um, like we've been talking about tonight. Where where are we going in 2024? Where is hi-fi? Where is home cinema and home theatre? Are projectors dead? Are, you know, how are we living? How are we interacting with all this kit? We're going to talk all about that, where we think we're going. And obviously, all of our favourites for the past 12 months, we're going to talk about that as well, as well as the editor's choice. So lots to get through on that podcast. That's going to be the 11th of December. And then on the 18th of December is the final podcast of the year. Uh, it's our Christmas party special. It'll be an hour long. Uh, we're going to have the movies team and uh, the guys here all together. Um, we're going to give you our roundup, our highlights of the year. And um, yeah, just basically our, our Christmas party. Uh, bring your games uh, and that kind of thing. Um, we're, we're, we're here for an hour. Um, so that's going to be pre-recorded, but it will go out on the 18th of December. And then, like I say, uh, stay tuned for beginning of January. We've got lots of CES uh, coverage coming. So uh, Andy and Ian will be doing all the news stories uh, as the news breaks um, from the show floor. Because even though I'm on the show floor, you don't see any of this stuff. It's only... <laughs> It's only, only when you look online that you see all this stuff. Uh, I'll be on the show floor as always and in some of these hotel suites speaking to manufacturers, find out exactly what's coming out for the year. Hopefully we'll get some sneak peeks, some early looks. Um, we'll also be doing our awards of CES, so we'll be giving out uh, to products that we think uh, are absolutely standout products. Uh, so that's all of our CES coverage coming in January as well. So that's everything to look forward to. We want your feedback as well. So please do get your feedback in, some of your ideas and uh, some of the things that you want to see us uh, introduce into the podcast next year. But that's uh, all coming up now. So all I need to do is ask Matt. Matt, did you enjoy yourself? I did. Thank you. Uh, it was nice having you. Hopefully we'll have you on uh, future podcasts uh, going forward. Um, and yeah, I think that this episode was definitely a solid five out of ten. So my mm. thanks to Ian, yeah. Jules, Martin, and Matt. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, it is appreciated. And of course, if you did like the podcast, then do all the cliched uh, social media stuff like liking and subscribing and so on. If you want to buy us a coffee, uh, head over to buyacoffee.com forward slash AV forums and uh, you can buy us a hot one there. I'm Phil Hinton. And thank you very much for watching and listening. And we'll see you again soon. Good night. Cheers.